Issues surrounding reproductive technology, global warming, and stem cell research have become hot button issues. They bring up fundamental questions surrounding ethics in our society, and many of these ethics stem from deeply held faith-based beliefs. My first guest has written and teaches on subjects surrounding technology and Christian ethics. And joining me in studio is Professor Larry Schmidt from the Center for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Thank you very much for coming in today. My pleasure. Now, here in Canada, perhaps we've been fortunate enough or privileged to really have a tradition of, of critical thought when it comes to technology. Both George Grant, uh, Ursula Franklin, Harold Innes as some of the more famous. Perhaps we could start by describing how perhaps you fit in or carry on that tradition and some of the work that you've done in, in, yeah. in fulfilling that. Well, I think I've been most strongly influenced by George Grant because I think his analysis is uh, the most profound. And in some ways, someone like Ursula Franklin doesn't have the philosophical background to be truly critical of modernity as a whole. Mm -hmm. And Grant had that depth. Um, now, of course, Grant's been dismissed, and many of his concerns have been sort of let slide. But I think that Grant will, will, will rise again as we begin to see that the, that the problems, the ethical issues, that we had so quickly run over and, and, and abandoned, thinking that technology would solve these problems, um, comes to the fore again. Well, and that has almost been, I suppose, the myth of if the 20th century, to really generalize, that technology has almost been invisible, that we've assumed that it has a progressive and really forward-looking an influence, but the reality has been quite different. Where does, I guess, an ethics or a critical perspective come in in balancing that euphoria? The euphoria? Well, I, I think I think that's that's the question that that we're wrestling with right now. How mm -hmm. do, how do we develop an ethical framework within which we can begin to deal with the issues that you've just mentioned? Mm -hmm. How do, how do we know whether to proceed with cloning? Mm -hmm. How do we know whether we should use certain techniques to solve the problem of global warming when the alternative is to sort of go back to a world that we don't want to go back to? Mm -hmm. and, and so we're caught. We're caught. But we don't have any criteria. This, mm -hmm. is, the, the, this is certainly my position, it's, and, and I think it's derived from Grant, that there are no criteria that what I call the Enlightenment faith, the faith in technology, mm -hmm. has accepted that would limit it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Why would we not proceed with stem cell research, with cloning, with certain types of, of energy technologies, with nuclear power? Mm -hmm. why, why shouldn't the Ontario government proceed down the road of spending another 40 to 60 billion dollars even if this plutonium waste is a bit of a problem. Why, why, I mean, at what point do we say this is too much, that mm -hmm. we can't take responsibility of this, not just individually, but collectively? And so, so those are the issues that, that really move me. Well, and global warming strikes me as being, on the one hand, a very pressing issue. There's been polls that have come out that said the vast majority of Canadians see it as the most important issue for politicians today. Yet, you sort of touch upon almost the irony or even idiocy that where we have a problem created by technology, we almost want to throw more technology at it, compounding yeah. the problem. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's basically it. And, and in the case of global warming, the, the, the then becomes the, the, the spin. Mm -hmm. The spin with regard to nuclear energy, of course, is that it is green and that it doesn't give off carbon emissions. But the, the problem is it does produce a waste that, uh, that is toxic for and, and, and very harmful to the environment if allowed to, to enter the environment mm -hmm. for minimally a thousand years and possibly for many thousands of years. And, and so the philosophical question that I've tried to raise with my class always, should we reject technologies, this is an Ursula Franklin idea, that one are not reversible, mm -hmm. that we cannot simply go back, like you, you can't make a nuclear power plant into a park. Right. Right? I mean, it, it never becomes something that you can reclaim mm -hmm. as part of your environment for thousands of years. But if we, you know, my own sense would be that if we can't reverse things, if we cannot act responsibly 
beyond three generations, then well, maybe we should drop back from that technique. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should say that is not an acceptable thing. Because, it's very, I mean, I, I don't, th some say the natives think of seven generations, but I, I think of three generations. I, I, when people say we have to be responsible for future generations, I find that as a society we can't, for the most part, be responsible for our own kids. Mm -hmm. We can't be res I mean, if, if, if you think what, what, what we are capable of, I think maximum is, is imaginatively we're capable of thinking three, four generations ahead. And if something is going to have consequences beyond that period, then my view would be let's not implement it. Well, and that almost suggests that there needs to be, I guess, a stopgap or something to force us every time we're about to make a step to say, is this the step we really want to right, make? Right, right, which would be, you know, my own understanding would be an ethic of limitation, mm -hmm. an ethic of limitation and humility with regard to the role of humanity within this cosmos, etc., which brings us back to, a, to, 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 to why I teach in the, in the Department for the Religion. That is, the traditional religions have had that conception. The modern religion, which is the religion of technology or the religion, the, the enlightenment faith, mm -hmm. is that we can proceed into the future and it will be onward and upward at all times. Well, which we, is almost a blind faith. Well, so given the 20th century, given what we've, what we've gone through in the 20th century, why would we continue to have that blind faith? Why would we not step, step back and say, what are the limitations? What are, how can we act with the requisite humility mm -hmm. as, as a race? And how can we implement that into our politics, into our education, etc.? Mm -hmm. um, another great Canadian thinker in this regard, and he hasn't received the, uh, the, the attention I think that he will, is a guy named William Vanderburg. Mm -hmm. Vanderburg teaches, in the, in, uh, like Ursula Franklin, in, in, in the engineering faculty. And he argues that, 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 our, that our focus almost always is on performance values. Mm -hmm. And we leave behind, when we get into engineering or when we get into contextual values, mm -hmm. the, context, the context within which we act. Literally the bigger picture. The bigger picture, mm -hmm. right. And Unfortunately, we just have to take a break, but we'll continue this discussion in a moment. I'm speaking with Professor Larry Schmidt from the, study, from the Center for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. We'll be back on, with more on this topic after the break. You're watching 3D Dialogue. I'm Jesse Hirsch, and I'm in studio today with Professor Larry Schmidt from the Center for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Now, before the break, we were almost talking, I, I guess, what I was inferring as a sort of two parallel tracks that strike me as, as coming to collision, collision, one being almost the religion of science or mm. the religion of the Enlightenment. And the other, I think, is, for lack of a better word, a, a general unease with the speed of technology, whether it be global warming, whether it be the way the Internet is really proliferating at a speed that most people can't keep up with. Do you see a point where there is a collision, where there is a need for a third way, shall we say, where people are, are, are critical and more conscientious of where we're going? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a vague awareness of this, but I, I don't see it coming to a head until there's, there's a crisis, like perhaps a global warming crisis. Mm -hmm. Someone like E.F. E. Schumacher, you know, if you read Small is Beautiful, this is now, he wrote this in 1970, mm -hmm. right? And, and, he, and he pointed out almost all of the basic elements that, that, that we find in the crisis that we're facing. Mm -hmm. He pointed out the element of, of, of uh, tolerance margins of nature. How much dioxin can you put into Lake Ontario before you can't drink it anymore, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we keep, and, 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 the, and the problem is that we're dependent upon science even to determine how much dioxin's in there, right? Mm -hmm. It's parts per trillion. You can't, you can't go down. And, <laughs> you can't and, do that by eye. <laughs> that's right. This is not, not checking it. And, and, and so, so we're, we're, we're caught in this. We, we have no choice but to use most advanced forms of science and technology and testing to determine our state. On the other hand, that advanced technology is 
creating the problems mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. the, the, the question of how to deal with this is I think the major, major crisis. My own sense too, to, to be fair, the Enlightenment faith has had its all, you know, had it all its own way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the success with which we have improved standards of living, improved, improved public health, particularly in the developed, uh, developed world, I mean, it's truly remarkable. You know, we can, most of us expect to live till close to 80 and as opposed to 45 in, 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 in you know, 1900. Mm -hmm. So the, the evidence is out there, all the posit positive evidence is out there, but the negative evidence is starting to come in. Mm -hmm. And the problem has been that the religious traditions, whether we're talking about particularly Protestants, Christianity, but also Catholicism in the, in the, in the West, but then if you look at Buddhism, Hinduism in the East, they do not have, as far as I can see, a sophisticated critique of technology that mm -hmm. would enable those traditions to do in the public sphere what they have done effectively oftentimes in the private sphere, that is, enable people to lead decent, honest lives of dignity, mm -hmm. even in the face of the vicissitudes, you know, the death, disease, etc. That, that's what, what one has to do, but we don't have, we don't have the bigger picture. We don't have the, the critique of technology. And, and my guess is that it will come, I mean, the But the question is if it comes too late, I guess. Well, it will come, it, it, I mean, it, it began to come in 1979, the World Council of Churches, which was the Protestant, Protestant wing of Christianity, began to think about faith and justice in, in a technological world. Mm -hmm. They've introduced all sorts of things, but none of them have really been considered important or effective in terms of people's understanding of their own faith. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where I think we're moving right now. Almost that there's a need, say, for an interfaith gathering of, obviously this is a global problem, right. whether global warming or nuclear proliferation or any of these technological challenges. Do you foresee an interfaith council or an interfaith gathering in which people try to forge a, a common ethical framework so we have the questions, we have well, I, the ability? I, to I, I do, but I think, uh, you know, I mean, th this has begun, I have a colleague, Stephen Sharper, who's, who, who's interested in what they've done at Harvard with regard to the environment, bringing mm -hmm. together faith communities and beginning to have them consult about these issues. This is just the beginning though, and, 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 and as a society we, we don't see the need oftentimes, and we don't even in the religious sphere see the need for a traditional ethic to inform our attitudes towards global warming, the internet, mm -hmm. a whole variety of things, or second realities, right? I mean, we, we, I've watched discussions of a second life, right? I mean, mm, all sorts of people virtual now, worlds. Yeah, I mean, we have trouble leading a, a single life with any integrity, or, but, but, but now we've got a second one, and the relationship between the two isn't clear. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, I think, one has to um, uh, hope that these, these traditions will begin to have an effect, because the tradition that is carrying us, which is the Enlightenment faith, doesn't have the resources either. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if there's a bankruptcy, that, yes. that we really are lacking the skills necessary to proceed in this technological society. And it also strikes me that there's a class dynamic that, you know, we here in the West, we've attained a level of industrialization, yet there are still countries around the world who desperately desire coal-burning power plants, desperately desire automobiles absolutely, in every home. Absolutely. To what extent can you balance the, the needs of class and the needs of, of well, it's really the a needs of society. class and it's the needs of developed versus less developed and 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 you just sort of look at uh, say Bertinsky's uh, photography and the movie based on it, the manufactured landscapes, and you think, oh my God, you know we're we're, we're back into 1830 in in Manchester, mm -hmm. right, or, mm -hmm. or or Glasgow. Uh, the way these people, and, and, and so are we going to go through the same sort of crazy pattern of industrialization and resource consumption and all of And really destruction in oh, terms Oh, absolutely of destruction. I mean, 1.4 million people, you know, moved along um, because we need a new, a, a new power dam. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. no one denies that, I mean, where, where does the West get any moral authority to tell China that it shouldn't proceed down that road. Yet at the same <laughs> time, perhaps if we could show them really the devastation, both social, moral, 
and economic that comes from the mistakes we've made, perhaps there could be a... Well, this, this I think, would be a, would be a decent discussion, but mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're not much capable of even reflecting on the terrible things that we've done in our, in, in our own society with, mm -hmm. with regard to war, with regard to, well, the, the, the obvious things like the Holocaust and the Second World War. We're not able to revisit those you can't get a debate in the United States about the wisdom of having dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. I'm not arguing one way or the other, but you can't well, you get can't a debate. You can't even discuss it. That's right. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not on the table. Mm -hmm. We're the only power, the West is the only power that's ever used those weapons. I mean, if you, if you can't get a debate about that, how do, how do you get off telling Iran that... Uh, what, what they can or what they can't do. do. Right. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I think you have made the case quite clearly for a need for an ethics of technology. Hopefully enough people will be watching this to be inspired, but if not, I hope you continue your great work in promoting such an approach. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Jesse. That was Professor Larry Schmidt from the Center for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Next on 3D Dialogue, we'll tell you about the correlation between spirituality, hope, and social activism. Please stay tuned.